Okay, here we go with our second uh, lecture on civil uh, liberties. Um, after this, I'm going to be posting at least one on civil rights, maybe two, and I'll try to keep them as short and as, as I can because uh, I don't want to be overly burdensome, but we do have to get through this material. Okay, so let's take the rest of the amendments uh, as they relate to civil liberties. Second Amendment. Second Amendment, of course, we know says that a well-regulated militia being necessary to the safety of, uh, of a free people, um, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And you can go read the text of the Second Amendment yourself. Um, the problem with the Second Amendment has traditionally been that little preamble there, there a well-regulated militia being necessary, etc. So the long-standing question has been, does that mean that every person in America has a right on some level to bear arms, to have weapons? Oh yeah, and so then they can be a militia. Or does it mean that the militia has a right to bear arms, and therefore the people who belong to the militia, which in our modern day would mean like the National Guard, have a right to bear arms. Um, the Supreme Court has actually dealt with very little in the way of this. Um, they had a case in uh, 1939, was the last time they actually dealt with the issue until 2008, when the case of uh, District of Columbia versus Heller came before the court. The court has previously found, before D.C. versus Heller, the court has found that the Second Amendment gives people a right to carry weapons, but that does not prevent a state from regulating the use of that weaponry. In other words, the people have a right to bear arms, but New York State is free to create licensing laws to forbid them being carried in certain places. So you can't uh, take a weapon into a school um, unless you are a, a police officer. Um, it regulates how they are kept. So if you, if you have a weapon, um, not only do you have to be licensed to have the weapon and have that particular weapon registered with the government, but they can regulate that when you are in your home, you have to keep it, uh, under lock and key. You know, you have to keep it one of those gun vault things, something along those lines. So the Supreme Court has consistent, consistently found that the states have a right to regulate how those weapons are possessed, as long as they don't stop you from possessing them at all. They could also bar certain people from having weapons. So if you have a felony conviction, um, you cannot own a, a gun. Okay, well, the District of Columbia in 2008 had such problem with gun violence that they they basically tried to make possession of handguns at all under any circumstances illegal. They knew they couldn't do that. The Second Amendment says that the people have a right to bear arms. So what they tried to do was use their regulation power to restrict that so heavily that it effectively banned weapons. Therefore, the question came before the court whether the provisions of the District of Columbia Code, that's the local um, uh, code of law for the, the District of Columbia and the city of Washington, um, the, the, that code barred the registration of handguns. So you could have a shotgun, you could have a rifle, but you could not register a handgun in D.C. You couldn't carry a pistol without a local license. So if you had that handgun from someplace else, you couldn't carry it without a license from D.C. 
and it required that all firearms be kept unloaded and disassembled or with a trigger lock, which is a, a lock, if you don't know what it is, that actually you stick it through the trigger and it locks with a key so that it's impossible to actually pull the trigger on the thing. So in order to use it, you would have to reassemble the gun if you had taken it apart, or you would have to get the key, unlock this trigger lock mechanism, and free up the gun, and it was a rather cumbersome. And the argument was that that basically made the gun useless if somebody invaded your house or something. If you were bearing your firearm lawfully, it would be so cumbersome for you to reassemble it or pull the trigger lock off, you, you couldn't really use it. Okay, so the question was, did those regulations violate the Second Amendment rights of individuals who are not affiliated with any state-regulated militia? The court found in Heller a couple of things that are important, but you have to watch. First of all, they found in Heller that the right to bear arms does not relate directly to the militia. In other words, the argument about whether or not you have to be a member of the state militia, a member of the National Guard, for the Second Amendment to apply to you, the court found you do not. So all citizens have Second Amendment rights. Second, they found that the requirement that you have to license a pistol before you're allowed to carry it, they found that that's okay. That doesn't um, overly inhibit your right to bear arms. So D.C. could have a law saying you couldn't carry a pistol unless you had a license. But they found that the law barring handguns and the law requiring that all firearms be kept unloaded and trigger locked, that that was overly restrictive and basically prevented people from having effective uh, use of weapons under the Second Amendment. So D.C. versus Heller said you can have a registration program, you can have a license program, but you cannot use it to bar all handguns or to allow people to have handguns but render them completely unusable. I would point out, though, that that's, that, that case is one of the very few that's come up on Second Amendment, and the District of Columbia don't forget, is federal territory. The very point of D.C. is that it is not a state. So all the laws in the District of Columbia are federal laws. And um, therefore, it's in a slightly different position from the states. If a state made a rule about this, what would the Supreme Court do? The decision in D.C. versus Heller was a 5-4 to four decision at the time, so it was a closely run thing. Would they find that states have a wider ability um, to regulate under the Second Amendment? I don't know. We have to wait till a court case is brought. My suspicion is that they would apply the same standard, however. If barring all handguns and barring guns except those that are disassembled is overly restrictive of Second Amendment, then um, I, I think it would be a, a selective incorporation case where they would say that the federal government can't ha, has a right to step in and tell the state of New York you can't bar the um, possession of all guns. I don't know that this will come up uh, in a significant way on the AP exam, since there's not that much litigation about it, but it is something you really do need to know. You should also realize that um, there are a lot of regulations about these weapons, and they vary widely from state to state. So, for instance, in New York, um, to own a handgun, to own a pistol, you basically have to go to the local government 
in our case, um, New York City, and specifically the police department, you have to make a case to them as to why you should be allowed to have a handgun. Uh, so a lot of doctors have them because they carry drugs. Um, a lot of people who deal in businesses with a lot of cash have them. Uh, in New York, there are two different kinds of permits, a, pre a premises permit and a carry permit. So it, there is one kind of license you get to have a gun on your property. Like if you are in a bank or something, you can have it in your office in the bank, which is different from the license that's a carry permit, which means you're allowed to walk around with it on your person. Um, and there is a difference between a, a concealed carry permit and an open carry permit. Um, so, you know, the, uh, whether, whether you are allowed to conceal the fact you have a weapon or not. So in New York, we have, we have strong restrictions. You can still own a handgun and you can still own a, what's called a long gun, a rifle or a shotgun. But you have to meet the state requirements, which are fairly restrictive. On the other hand, if you go out west to Texas or Oklahoma, um, the restrictions are far less to, at least from a New Yorker's viewpoint, almost non-existent. So, but that's, that's a matter of federalism, where each state gets to make its own sub-rules as long as they don't violate the principle of the Second Amendment, which is that the citizens have a right to bear arms at all. Okay, Third Amendment is the quartering of troops. The government cannot quarter troops in your house unless they they follow a judicial process to allow them to do that. Uh, that's rarely an issue these days, so we'll leave it aside. Um, that gets us to Fourth and Fifth Amendments, which are all about criminal matters. Okay, so before we get to those amendments, let's just remember that within the Constitution itself, there are certain restrictions of the government. Before you get to the Bill of Rights, built into the Constitution are the following. First of all, that except in times of rebellion, um, or times where of actual invasion of the United States, you, the, the uh, President and Congress cannot suspend habeas corpus. And as you know, um, habeas corpus, which should really be pronounced correctly, habeas corpus, um, is that you may have the body. It's second person singular, uh, present subjunctive active of habio habere, in order that you may have the body. A writ of habeas corpus. Um, and I should point out that habeas corpus is referred to as the great writ sometimes. A writ is an order from a court to do something. Habeas corpus is a command from a court to the executive branch, to the police, to demonstrate to the court what legal right they have to be holding the body, to be holding you in custody. Now, habeas means a couple of different things. On its simplest level, it means that if you are arrested, the um, arresting authority, the police, have to bring you before a properly constituted court, an independent judge, and show that the that they have a legal right to be holding you. You are informed of your rights by the judge. We will see in a few minutes what those are. You are now a days um, given the opportunity for counsel for uh, a lawyer to advise you. The court makes sure that you understand what the charges specifically are against you and the police have to demonstrate that they have probable cause 
to believe that a crime has been committed and that you are the person who committed the crime. Probable cause is the lowest level of proof in our justice system. All probable cause means is that a, a police officer has reason to believe that a crime has been committed and reason to believe that you are the person who committed it. That's all. No proof beyond that. Habeas is important because without the, the right to a writ of habeas corpus, the cops could arrest anybody they wanted for any reason or no reason at all, throw them in jail for as long as they wanted, and release them when they felt like it, or dealt with them some other way. Because of habeas, you are entitled to due process before a judge. That's why it's called the Great Writ. It's the it's the um, it's the right that we have that makes the whole justice system work. And that term, Great Writ, doesn't come from American law. It comes from English law, British law. Because in England, habeas exists, and it was the thing. Uh, one way to think of it is that even the government is subject to the law. Remember, the cops in England operate as agents of the crown. The prosecutor in England is called the crown prosecutor. So even the queen, even the king, when they have one, is subject to the law and is required to appear, if you will, before the court to prove that when they arrest somebody, they have a reason to do that. Habeas is used in other ways, too. It is a way that um, those who have been convicted of crimes can have their cases reviewed. So they can file, with, this is a different use of the term habeas corpus, they can file with the court to ask the court to review to make sure that the government truly has a right to be holding them in custody. That is to say that they were properly convicted if they've reached that stage. It's a way to make an appeal. Um, if you think you were improperly convicted as a matter of law or something, you can ask a court to issue a writ of habeas corpus, which requires the government to come in and show um, that the court, the case was conducted properly and that you were properly convicted. Habeas is, um, as I said, the fundamental right. And in the United States, under the Constitution, the only time you can suspend that right to habeas corpus is if you are in the middle of a rebellion or an invasion. Uh, Lincoln suspended it in um, during the Civil War, and it was extremely controversial at the time. It may have been unconstitutional, although it never really got challenged. But it's that important, that sacred a thing. <coughs> Second thing to note is that in the Constitution, the main part of the Constitution, not the amendments, um, ex post facto laws are barred. Ex post facto, Latin, of course, from after, literally from after the thing having been done. Um, facio facere, facto is uh, the ablative singular of um, the uh, fourth principal part, the perfect passive participle. So it literally means from after the thing having been done. All that means is that you can't be arrested for committing a crime that was not a crime at the time you did it. So, um, uh, you can't make, uh, how do I put it? You can't make retroactive laws. Uh, if, if you cross uh, the street, if you cross uh, Tyson's Lane, and the next day the uh, mayor is out to get you, so he makes a law saying it's illegal to cross Tyson's Lane, and you did it yesterday, so... We're arresting you for having broken today's law yesterday. That's illegal in the United States. Um, 
that actually is supposed to be illegal in England. And one of the complaints during the revolution is that ex post facto laws were passed. So that's a second sort of guarantee of fairness for you. The, the rules are the rules at the moment you did the act. If it turns out later that they make that very same act illegal, well, the, the fact that you did it yesterday means you're off the hook. Third, illegal under the Constitution is our bills of attainder. Bills of, of attainder are something you don't see much nowadays. <clears throat> but they were used in uh, England at times until they were outlawed in England as well. Bills of attainder are when a person is declared guilty by a legislative act. So in other words, there's no trial held. The, the person isn't arrested and brought before a court or any of that. Parliament would simply pass a law declaring that, you know, the Duke of Norfolk is hereby declared to be guilty of treason. Um, bills of attainder were used primarily for things like treason as a way to get rid of the king's enemies. And they were particularly handy because bills of attainder normally did what's called, they worked, they worked corruption of the blood. Corruption of the blood meant that uh, the person who was declared guilty, they would be taken off and usually executed, because it was usually that kind of a crime. And their property, their lands, which would normally be inherited by their, their family, their, their oldest son or whatever, would be, um, as, they, as is said in, England, in uh, legal terminology, would be a sheet to the crown. In other words, it would be confiscated by the government and the heirs would be declared attainted by the, the same corruption of the blood, and so they would be they would lose their title, their inheritance, and all that. So if the king had an enemy and a guy he suspected was disloyal, he could get him um, declared guilty by a bill of attainder, and not only get him executed, but permanently impoverish his family, take all of his money and lands for himself as king. <coughs> And the family would inherit nothing, including the title. All of that is illegal under the Constitution. Okay, so that gets us then to Fourth Amendment. Fourth Amendment is about search and seizure. And it protects us against, quote, unreasonable searches and seizures. As you know, the um, text of the uh, Fourth Amendment says that, uh, there I decided to include a, a copy of the text here just so you see it. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, and papers and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized. So, as you may remember, during the American Revolution, you had, or just before the American Revolution, you had these things called writs of assistance, which were blanket search warrants. They were given to enforcement officers who were empowered to search anything and everybody for anything they might happen to find. Well, that's illegal in the United States. Um, you cannot, the police officer cannot search a person their house, their papers, or their effects, their, their objects, their possessions, unreasonably. And a search warrant can only be given for probable cause, that is probable, a belief that a crime has probably been committed, um, and that there is evidence probably in such and such a place. When the police officer goes to the judge to get that warrant, he has to take an oath swearing to the truth of what he's saying, which means if he's lying, it's a crime. And he has to particularly describe the place to be searched and what 
um, and the person that he's looking for or the things that he's looking for. So they don't, they can't just go in with a blanket warrant that says you can search wherever you feel you need to for whatever you think you might find. Well, okay, so the unreasonable searches and seizure thing, that means that normally you have to have a search warrant that specifies what you're looking for and the place you're looking for. But you don't need a search warrant to search uh, the person who is being arrested. When the person is arrested, police officers have a right to search their person there. That's on the grounds of safety, to make sure they're not carrying a weapon or something that they might use to harm themselves or anybody else. And if they find anything along the way, like drugs in your pocket, that's a permissible search, and that counts as evidence. Police officers are allowed to search anything that's, quote, in plain view. If you ever get stopped by a cop, you will notice that he doesn't just walk up to the window and talk to you. He or his partner will spend a lot of time uh, looking in the back seat through the window, looking in the front seat through the window, uh, looking around, looking around, because if they can see it, you know, without going into the vehicle, without poking their nose in there, if they can see it in plain sight, that is not a violation of the search. So if they, if they see, a, um, I don't know, the, what looks like the handle of a pistol sticking out from under the back seat, that's a, that's reason to believe you're carrying a weapon. And, you know, that then triggers a whole series of events. So there's the plain view exception. If um, you, if they are allowed to search with consent. I'm skipping down for a minute. So if a police officer comes to the door of the house, knocks on the door, you open the door, good night, hi, do you mind if I come in? And you say, sure, come on in. You've just consented to him entering your premises. Anything he sees on your kitchen table is you know fair game if or if he comes into the living room and says um uh you mind if i get a glass of water from your kitchen sink and you say sure anything he sees in your kitchen anything he can see with his eyes as he walks around you consented to allow him on the property so he doesn't need a warrant to enter the house now because you consented and anything he sees is fair game um, similarly, if at any time you agree to anything, if he says, you mind if I look in the back seat, you mind if I look in the trunk, or it, it doesn't have to be at that explicit. He can say, uh, you don't mind if I look in here, do you? Or, uh, can I take a look at this? Or, uh, um, you know, that, and you just go along with it. You say, yes, you nod. You've given consent for a search. It is fair game. Doesn't need a warrant to search objects or areas in the arrestee's immediate control, or that should be or within the arrestee's reach. So what, what that sounds legal, it is legal. What it means is if you're being arrested, uh, anything, you're being arrested in the front seat of your car, anything they can, they, um, that is within your reach in the front seat there, so if you could reach over and um, open the glove compartment or you could reach under the seat, as they're arresting you, they're allowed to check there, again, on the grounds that they don't have time to get a warrant and you may be, you may have a weapon under the seat or something along those lines. Uh, they can enter premises under exigent circumstances which means an emergency. If they come up to your front door and knock and there's no answer and they hear a scream and a gunshot from inside, they're allowed to knock down the door because there appears to be an emergency taking place. If they think evidence is about to be taken away from the place or destroyed. So if um, they're there for a... Um, they're there for a drug they've just seen you buy 
drugs, let's say, and you walk into your house, and they come up behind you, they knock on the door, and they start hearing the toilet flush inside, that could be a signal that you are trying to destroy evidence. So they can act um, without a warrant there. Why? Because all of those are considered reasonable searches. It's not unreasonable for the police officers to secure a prisoner and make sure that they're not carrying weapons and they're not a danger to the officers or to themselves. You know, if you're carrying um, something in your pockets, a knife or something, and you might harm yourself or anybody else, um, they want to make sure that they don't wind up in a gunfight or that evidence that's, that's clearly around doesn't get immediately destroyed. Other than that, if they think that you have committed a crime, you know, you, the old detective show thing, and they're sitting around the station house, and they've decided you're the guy, and they want to go to your home and look through your files, or look at your old photographs, or see if you've got anything in your closet that matches the clothes that the killer wore or something, they have to go to a judge and get a warrant saying, uh, we are going to go to, you know, 123 Main Street to apartment 2B, and we're looking for, um, you know, a green suit that may have may show evidence. If they find other evidence while they are making that search, that is covered by their warrant. If they find other stuff, um, that is okay. Well, what's the check on the police? What's to stop them from simply, you know, finding exceptions and finding ways around this? It's called the exclusionary rule. The exclusionary rule says that any evidence obtained by an illegal search is not admissible in court. So if the cops illegally search your house, if they, if they went in there thinking you may or may not have um, committed a crime, but they'd like to talk to you, and they knock on the door, they don't get an answer, but they decide to go in anyway, and they go through your house and they find in your closet, you know, 60 pounds of drugs, they didn't have a warrant to make that search, and so they can't use that as evidence against you. That's the incentive they have to do it right the first time, the exclusionary rule. Map versus Ohio is a 1961 case, which is important because it extended the exclusionary rule to the states as well. Fourth Amendment is viewed as a fundamental right now against unreasonable searches and seizures, and so the Supreme Court in 61 said that if the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, violates Fourth Amendment, the evidence they find can't be used against you. And if the New York City Police Department does the same thing, even though it is a state, um, the NYPD, the police officers work for the city, but they are empowered by New York state law, and they are usually looking for violations of state law, if they execute a search illegally without a proper warrant, then the information that they gain from that search cannot be used against the person. Again, this is not intended as a way to let lots of guilty people go free. It's intended as an extra sort of um, kick to police officers to tell them, you better make sure you do this absolutely right, you follow the law, you can get a warrant. You can get a telephonic warrant now. You can pick up the telephone to a judge, explain the circumstances, and the judge can authorize over the telephone for you to go and do whatever, uh, uh, you know, search whatever needs to be searched. But you better do it by the book, otherwise you're going to wind up losing the case. Uh, so Mappy, Ohio, you can look up on Oyez. 
There's a whole bunch of cases that refer to this. Far too many for us to go through, far too many, I think, for AP to ask specifically about because they get very nitpicky and very difficult when you apply the exclusionary rule and when you don't, how, plain, how in plain sight is in plain sight, exceptions to this and so on. I can tell you that one particular exception is the border inspection exception. Border inspection exception means that when you come into or go out of the country, um, everything you have can be completely searched top to bottom, and they don't need a warrant or any particular reason. Now, what, what can get searched? Well, you're using it right now to listen to me. That is to say, a computer or a cell phone. The border, um, the Department of Homeland Security has every right, and the courts have found that this is okay under the Fourth Amendment, to take your computer or take your cell phone and go through every single file on it if they want to, to see what you have on it. Um, crossing, in crossing the border, you are not covered by the Fourth Amendment right. So they can go through all of your stuff, as I said, including holding your computer and going through every file on it, every picture, every chat log, every whatever else you've got on there, to see if there's anything on there that they don't like or violates the law or is not allowed to be taken into or out of the country. There's a lot of litigation on Fourth Amendment. Um, um, I, I also, there we go, I, uh, you know, as I'm thinking about it here, talking to you, I figured, let me, let me include two other cases here. I don't know that they're, I don't think they're in your books, and they probably won't be on the AP exam itself, but you might be interested in the subject. Um, uh, first of all, I can say, as I said, there's a lot of litigation about this, including about searches and seizures in public schools. Um, don't worry, in private schools, you have no rights at all. Your lockers are completely searchable because the school technically owns them and you have no control of them. If they're, you're, they're under what's called dual control, and which means that the school can let a cop look in them anytime we want. Um, but uh, the exclusionary rule began with a case called Weeks versus the United States in 1914, which is when the court first decided that under federal law, federal law, um, the exclusionary rule applied, which is any arrest by a federal law enforcement officer for a federal crime had to follow Fourth Amendment, and if the search was illegal, you couldn't use the evidence. 1920, Silverthorne Lumber versus U.S. is an interesting case because it took it a step further. Under Silverthorne, any evidence you obtain as a result of evidence you obtain from an illegal search is also out. It's called the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine. Oops, I can't even type anymore. Meaning that um, just as, as with a tree, if you poison the roots of a tree and you eat the apple off the tree, you're going to get poisoned. So if you execute an illegal search warrant, or let's say you make a search without a warrant, you make a warrantless search and it doesn't come under one of the exceptions above. So the search was illegal. And in the course of that search, you find um, a, I don't know, a, a, a big bag of drugs with a guy's name and address on it for delivery to John Jones, 123 Main Street. And then you use that as evidence that John Jones must be dealing drugs. So you go down to John Jones's house and you catch him in the act of dealing drugs. 
John Jones is off the hook because you wouldn't have gone to his house if you didn't have the evidence that you got from the illegal search, the evidence of which you cannot use. So the fruit of the poisonous tree says any evidence you get from an illegal search is bad and anything that flows from it. Any, if you, if you, if you get, um, if you get John Jones to confess, but you do so based on the fact of evidence that you got in an illegal search, the confession is out. Map v. Ohio, as we said, extended the exclusionary rule to cover states as well. Okay, Fifth Amendment. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on presentment or indictment of a grand jury except in cases arising in the land or naval forces in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger. Let me just take that part of this first. Capital crime means a crime for which you can be executed, or an otherwise infamous crime, so basically any serious crime. So a person can't be held to answer for a serious crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury. So we haven't talked about the courts yet much, but let me just explain this. If you are arrested for a minor crime, you're brought before a judge. Uh, you are informed of the charge against you. Arrangements are made for a trial, and you may be tried in front of a judge, or you may be tried in front of a judge and a jury. If you are accused of a felony, which is a crime that um, for which you can go to jail for a year or more, you are accused normally, and all of this gets a bit technical and, and a bit complicated, but normally you are accused of the crime by a grand jury. The grand jury is unlike what you see on TV. The grand jury is 24 members who meet um, usually one, sometimes two days a week for a long period of time. And their job is to listen to cases brought to them by the district attorney and then to vote by majority on what charge to bring against the individual in that case. They are not deciding whether a person is guilty or innocent. So if a prosecutor has arrested you and thinks that you have committed murder, before he can take you to trial, he has to go in front of the grand jury. As I said, the grand jury is made up of a bunch of citizens. They do not all have to be there every time the grand jury meets. It's like a committee, more than we think of as a jury. Um, they vote, and it has to be a majority vote. doesn't have to be unanimous. They listen to the evidence the prosecutor brings, and then the grand jury decides whether to accuse you specifically of um, intentional murder or murder by reckless disregard for human right, the human life, which is different, or to charge you with manslaughter, which is um, a, a step down from murder. It means you, you wrongfully caused another person's death, but you may not have intended to cause their death, but your actions were reckless and negligent. Um, they have a bunch of different charges they could bring, and the, or they could decide that the um, the prosecutor does not have enough evidence that a crime was committed at all, or enough evidence that you are the person who probably committed the crime, even to bring the case to trial, and they can decide to vote what's called no true bill, saying, you know, there's nothing here. The idea of a grand jury was to prevent prosecutors from dragging people into court, anybody they felt like. 
putting them in front of a regular jury, which is 12 persons, and trying them. That's a terrifying ordeal for people, and the fear was that prosecutors could manipulate them. So the grand jury system, uh, which is also something we inherited from British common law, was supposed to be a break on the prosecutor. So prosecutors couldn't just accuse people of crimes. They had to go first in front of this preliminary group that would hear the evidence. They didn't decide that you were guilty. They decided that there was enough evidence here to show that there may have been a crime and enough evidence here to show that you may be the person who did it, that this is something that should go to a full regular trial with a judge and jury to determine. Therefore, the Fifth Amendment says you can't be charged with one of these serious crimes unless a grand jury has reviewed it, unless you're in the military. The military runs by different rules. It has to run by different rules because uh, when you're in the army, you're under a completely different command structure. So they follow their own system of rules. You have some rights, but not quite the same that you do in civilian life. Okay, so let's talk then about the second thing. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. So we bar double jeopardy. That is, if a prosecutor accuses you of a crime and brings you to trial on it, and you are acquitted of that crime, you cannot be tried again for that same crime. Now, in one way, that looks unfair, because what if new evidence emerges later on? On the other hand, the reason that was put in was so that a prosecutor couldn't bring you to trial, the jury acquits you, so he brings you to trial again to try to find another jury that will convict you, and he, that could go on forever. So he's got one shot at you. And for those of you who really care about legal matters, jeopardy attaches, we say, when the prosecutor opens his mouth and speaks the first word in front of the jury. So all the preliminary stuff and the stuff in front of the judge, it's when the jury is actually seated to hear the trial and the prosecutor stands up and addresses the jury for the first time. At that moment, we say jeopardy has attached and the prosecutor has to finish out the trial. And if he gets a conviction, great. And if he doesn't get a conviction, he can't go back after you again. Fifth Amendment. No, I'm going on now. Nor shall uh, a person be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. Nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Okay, so the private property for just compensation. Uh, I'm going to just mention to you what that is. We're not going to deal with it too much now, but that's a thing called eminent domain. That means that the government has a right to take your property if it is truly needed for public use, but they have to go through a process before an independent judge and prove that's the case, and they must give you fair compensation for it. Now, what, when would that ever happen? Well, let's say, for instance, that um, we need to build uh, um, a new road. It's vitally important to the future of um, Staten Island that we build the Staten Island Expressway. This was actually done. The government can go around and ask people politely if they'd please sell us their property, or they can go to court, prove that the government truly needs their property, prove it to a judge, and then prove to the judge that they are going to pay the people involved just compensation for taking their land, which means fair market value for the property. They can't just, the government can't just come in and condemn a piece of property for no reason and take it away. Nor can they come in and just condemn a piece of property for a good reason, but not pay you for it. Okay, so that backs us up then to the real 
point I'm making here with Fifth Amendment, which is no person nor shall any person be compelled in a criminal case to act as a witness against himself. That is um, your right against your right against whoops self incrimination. It is an old principle of British law that again is being brought into the Fifth Amendment here that a person cannot be compelled to be a witness against themselves. Among other things, this is to prevent people from being tortured into confessions. We also now know, if I can, if I can say for those of you who follow these things, that confessions are notoriously um, uh, uh, inaccurate. They're not, re they're not always reliable. I know that sounds crazy for those of you who haven't studied these things. It may sound nuts, but the least reliable evidence is eyewitness testimony and confessions. People, there are a lot of people who can be, who can be convinced that they've done something that they haven't, or who will say anything to please the people who are holding them. Um, or who will confess because they're afraid if they don't, even if they didn't commit the crime, things are going to be a whole lot worse for them. And, of course, in England, you had this tradition of people being tortured into confessions. So you can't be compelled to be a witness against yourself. You can choose to, but that's your free choice. The controlling decision here is famously, of course, Miranda v. Arizona, 1966 which gives us the great TV cop thing. The Supreme Court found that when the police have you in custody, and custody means that they are holding you and you cannot leave. So if the cops say you're free to go at any time, look, we'd like you to come in and sit down and talk to us. Yeah, and there's the door. You can always leave whenever you want. You are not being held in custody under the law. You may feel like you are, but you are not. If the cops are holding you in custody, that is, they've said you're under arrest, you cannot leave. At that time, anything you say, anything that you confess, any information you give them, they cannot use against you unless they have first told you, reminded you, of your rights. And as you know from TV, I'm sure, first of all, you have the right to remain silent. What that means is you cannot lie to the cops. It is never acceptable to lie to law enforcement under the law. On the other hand, you don't have to tell them anything. So you can't tell them an untruth but you also don't have to tell them the truth, which means your only alternative is to remain silent. So when they ask a question, you can just simply not answer. So you have the right to remain silent, and they have to remind you that if you give up that right, anything you say can be used against you. You've given up your right against self-incrimination. They also have to remind you, the court said, that you have a right to have uh, legal counsel. The law is a complicated, f frightfully complicated thing. And the average person doesn't know anything about it and cannot effectively defend themselves. They cannot have effective, useful due process unless they have an expert assisting them and advising them. Therefore, the court has found, as we'll see in a few minutes, that you have a right to have an attorney. Someone, an expert in the law, licensed by the state, to advise you during questioning. And then they inform you, as we'll see in a few minutes, that if you can't afford an attorney, 
Just because you're poor doesn't mean you don't have rights, and you don't have a right to due process. And they find that due process means effective due process, one that's truly meaningful. And you only get that if you've got somebody who can give you guidance and advice and explain to you what's happening. Therefore, you get a lawyer. So the cops have to say, you have the right to remain silent. Anything and everything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to have an attorney present all questioning. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for you. Only after they've said that can they then say, do you give up your right to have an attorney? And do you give up your right to remain silent? Will you answer my questions? Will you tell me what's going on? Okay, Sixth Amendment, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial. So first of all, they can't just throw you in jail and leave you there for weeks and weeks and months and months. You have a right to a speedy trial. And if the delay is caused by the government that keeps delaying and delaying and delaying, the case can get thrown out by violating speedy trial. Public trial. Public trial, secret trials are not normally permitted. They can be in certain national security cases where the very testimony involved um, is talking about, you know, high level government secrets. But normally they have to be, the trial has to be completely public to prevent shenanigans from going on from the government playing fast and loose with the rules. You shall enjoy a uh, uh, right to a, to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed. It had to be local people. They couldn't ship people in from elsewhere. Remember, during the Ameri before the American Revolution, cases American cases were being heard up in Canada and such. Well, that didn't seem fair. If you're being judged by a jury of your peers, um, your peers mean your neighbors, the people who know your circumstances, the people who are around you. Uh, and should be, <coughs> shall enjoy the right to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation. So you have to be given a copy of the charges against you. You have a right to be confronted with the witnesses against you. So we can't have anonymous testimony of some guy said. If the case is going to be based on a witness, you have a right to bring that witness into court yourself and ask them questions to see if they're lying. You have the right to compulsory process for obtaining witnesses. That means that you can subpoena witnesses. And I don't mean to be treating you like dumb guys, but I don't know if you know this. Subpoena is from the Latin sub poena under penalty. Um, there's two kinds of subpoena, uh, subpoenas, a subpoena uh, ad testificandum and a subpoena, uh, um, no, subpoena duches tecum, which are wonderful Latin words they'll never ask on the AP. A subpoena ad testificandum is a command that you are to appear in court Ad testificandum, for the purpose of testifying, sub poena, under penalty. If you don't show up, you go to jail. So poena duches tecum is under penalty, duches cum te, you will bring with you. That's to get records. <clears throat> so you can, um, I don't know, you can subpoena the accountant of your firm to testify, and or you can subpoena the accountant of your firm to bring the official legal accounting records of your company with them. You have a right to what's called compulsory process. That is, if you're a defendant, you can also make witnesses show up whether they like it or not so that you get a fair shot at having evidence on your behalf. And you have the right to the assistance of counsel for your defense. As I was saying a few minutes ago, you have a right to effective due process. Effective due process means that somebody guides you through what can be very complicated. And so you have the right to have a lawyer sitting next to you who can either speak in your name 
or at least advise you and tell you what's going on. Gideon v. Wainwright, which you should already be familiar with, um, was a case where this was applied, 1963, to state courts as well. So let me just point out to you at this point, right, what's been going on all along here? These Bill of Rights started off applying to the federal government, period. And then through this idea of um, uh, selective incorporation, the incorporation doctrine, they've been extended and extended and extended. So if you have a right as a citizen of the United States, then you also have that same right as a citizen of New York State, and New York State has to recognize that. Don't forget, guys, important term to know, to know, to know. Dual citizenship. Each of us is citizen both of the state of New York and of the United States. And our rights, fundamental rights as citizens of the United States, have to be respected and adhered to by, citizen, uh, by the state of New York, of which we are also citizens. That idea has been expanded and expanded. So the 20th century, if you've been noticing these cases, has been a long series of taking these rights under the Constitution and applying them more and more and more to the states as well. So that right to counsel, thanks to Gideon Wainwright, which was a Florida case, you can read the details of it, says that you have a right to counsel and that your counsel... Um, uh, I should also point out, it, it said you had a right to counsel and extended it to the state. It also emphasized that that counsel has to be free. So the poor who cannot afford an attorney must be given a public defender. In some places, like in New York, we have organizations that do that, legal aid society and other parts of the country. There is an office of the public defender who's a government you know, a government agency. Uh, in many cases, that work is done, as we say, pro bono, another Latin legal term, for the good, that is, for the good of society. So lawyers volunteer their time to do that. Okay. Okay, Eighth Amendment uh, is cruel and unusual punishment. Um... I'll just speak briefly about this. You know, you can read this, but um, Greg v. Georgia was the, by that time, a lot of the states were abolishing death penalties, and there was a movement saying that death penalty counts as cruel and unusual punishment. Um, Greg, the Greg case, the Supreme Court found that the death penalty is not cruel and, and unusual uh, as long as it is restricted to certain circumstances. So it would be cruel and unusual to apply it to everything. But if you were applying it to murders with, you know, particular heinous circumstances, uh, uh, torture murder or mass murder, or that sort of thing, you were within, as they understood it, constitutional bounds. Um, McCluskey v. Kemp um, was kind of a, an offbeat case, but worth noting. Um, I shouldn't say offbeat, but it was a challenge to the death penalty based on its unequal application to minorities. So McCluskey um, brought a, uh, uh, a case based upon statistical evidence showing that more minority groups were, had been subjected to the death penalty than um, than whites. And the court found that while that may be a true issue, and that might be an issue for the legislature to consider, you couldn't show that it applied in that particular case. In other words, in order to overturn the decision of a court, 
a jury that had heard the case in state court, the Supreme Court said they would have had to find some reason that either the defendant himself was not guilty or that the death penalty was applied against that particular defendant for particular, let's say, racist reasons in that moment. You couldn't just show that the defendant was one of many black men who had been given the death penalty, and because more black men than white men were given the death penalty for the same crime, therefore, what? The court said it doesn't prove that this particular black guy doesn't deserve the death penalty as much as anyone else. This is another, this is a, 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 an appropriate moment to just point out that one of the things, we haven't talked about it really in, the, in these cases, but you do have a separation of powers problem here and a political question issue. And I just point out those two ideas for you that you really should pay attention to, to and know. Separation of powers, of course, you already know. The three branches do their own thing. But sometimes you have to stop and think about what that really means. It is not for the courts to set government policy. It's for the courts to apply the law written by the legislature or to declare the law illegal because it's unconstitutional. But it's not for the court to manage the details of how a law is applied or to determine whether a law is a good idea or a bad idea. That's why we have legislatures. Determining whether a law is a good idea or a bad idea is a political question. And political there is not, you know, does not have a negative connotation. It doesn't mean bad or merely politics. It's political in the best sense of the word. It is a matter for the political process, our election process, our legislative process to determine, not for the courts to decide. Therefore, in these um, Eighth Amendment cases, the court in both cases basically said um, that if the state of Georgia wants to have a death penalty, that's up to the people of the state of Georgia. We don't find that it's being imposed unfairly, you know, that is to uh, one group versus another. We don't find that it is being imposed arbitrarily. We don't find that it's being imposed unusually. It is being imposed in a traditional way, that is for the most heinous crimes. And even if we may not like that, or we do like it, it's up for the people of Georgia through their political process of electing legislatures to decide. So that's an important thing to note. Now, that doesn't, I'm not taking a side as to whether or not, well, actually, I will take a side. The death penalty, I think, is morally indefensible. I've said it. You guys know I'm open to debate on such things. Um, but that's a moral position I am taking as what I believe is fundamental human morality, which is not the same thing as legality. The question then would become, well, if you don't like it, how would you change it? And an argument, and I won't make it, I will not give you a position on this, an argument can be made that the correct way to change it is through electing anti-death penalty legislators to get a law passed by Congress or by the New York State Legislature rather than by getting a court to, um, to declare it unconstitutional. On the other hand, the question is, what does cruel and unusual mean? And that's where you get into that, um, that's where you get into one of those problems of interpretation. You have originalists and living constitution types. The originalists say the words mean what they meant 
in 1789 when they were written. The original meaning of the words in the original Constitution, and therefore cruel and unusual, is what it was meant by, by uh, what James Madison meant by them. Living constitutionalists say words like cruel and unusual change over time. What is cruel and unusual in 2015 is not the same thing as what was cruel and unusual in 1789, and therefore we should rule appropriately. I just point out both sides of this. The originalists say, if we don't sort of freeze the Constitution, if we don't say it means one thing and it means what it meant when it was put on paper, then you can turn it into meaning anything you want. You can redefine the words any way you feel like in any given year, and then the Constitution starts to mean nothing. The living constitutionalists will point out that um, we as human beings have grown, have evolved, have learned. Um, you know, we don't, uh, it was perfectly acceptable in 1789 to beat the living daylights out of your own kids. That was considered discipline. Now we understand that that's terribly damaging to kids and is cruel. So, you know, that's the argument you get in types of interpretation. Okay, I want to hit now quickly the right to privacy. <clears throat> the right to privacy does not exist in the Constitution in explicit terms. As you know from reading the Constitution, there, it, words never occur, the right to privacy. Louis Brandeis was um, one of our most famous legal scholars. He became a uh, justice of the Supreme Court. Um, but before he was a justice in 1890, he wrote a famous essay on the right to privacy in the Constitution, in which he found that um, the first, third, fourth, ninth, and fourteenth amendments, um, that there is a, a penumbra. That's a good word. Let's use that. Penumbra, penumbra means a shadow, right? Um, that's literally what the word means in Latin and what you use it in astrology. When the, when the earth crosses over the moon, right, and makes a crescent moon, that's the penumbra. The umbra is the shadow and the penumbra is the lighter shadow around it, yeah? So, in law, we talk about um, uh, the the First Amendment having a penumbra, that is, um, the sort of fuzzy edges of it that are covered by it. Brandeis found that in those amendments, there is implied a right to privacy, what he calls a right to be left alone, that is presumed by the Constitution. And if you think about things like uh, right against unreasonable search and seizure, you have a right to be left alone unless the government has a real reason to think you've committed a crime or you've got evidence of a crime. So Brandeis found in the Constitution a right to privacy. It didn't get very far with him. There were a number of cases, um, uh, if you're really interested, you can look up this one, um, Olmstead. Olmstead v. U.S., which is a case from when he was on the Supreme Court. William Howard Taft was the um, was the Chief Justice, and Olmstead v. United States is really the first wiretap case in the United States. Um, guy Olmstead was a bootlegger, and they they tapped his phone. This is the 1920s. Wiretapping was a new technology, and he challenged the right of the government to to tap the phones. Um, the right to privacy didn't really get asserted in those, but it begins to show up in law with Griswold v. Connecticut. Griswold v. Connecticut, 65 case, was, um, Connecticut had a law against selling contraception, contraceptive devices. Um, so Griswold, the, the Griswolds were a married couple who thought that the law preventing them from engaging in a private 
activity between two married people was Connecticut invading the privacy that they are guaranteed under the Constitution. So they brought the case. And the Supreme Court found in Griswold that there exists in the Constitution an implied right to privacy, and therefore Connecticut couldn't interfere. Okay, that gets ramped up in 1973 with Roe v. Wade. Um, Roe v. Wade, as you know, is the decision that made abortion legal in the United States. Uh, we could do a whole semester on Roe v. Wade, but briefly, um, under Roe v. Wade, abortion is legal through all nine months of pregnancy. There are a lot of people who misunderstand Roe or don't really have not really read it, so they don't understand the law. Under Roe, you can a woman can have an abortion for any reason or no reason at all for the first three months. She can have an abortion for up to the sixth month for any reason um, as long as her doctor goes along with it. And, um, you know, you can't really have an abortion without a doctor doing it. So by definition, if you're having an abortion, it's legal. Um, and she can have an abortion for any reason up through and including the ninth month. Uh, as long as there is a reason of health of the mother. But health, this is very important, is defined by later court decisions as emotional well-being. So I'm not playing an advocate here. I'm telling you what the law is, and you can go look it up. If a woman says that having this child, if, if she is in her ninth month, if she, ha if she has begun labor, you know, she's about to give birth and says that having this child would emotionally upset her or the fact that she has this child means she might um, be economically deprived and that would upset her, that is sufficient grounds to have an abortion. And the abortion is legal, by the way. Uh, up through delivery of the child. So there is a form of abortion, which is sometimes simply referred to as a late-term abortion, um, but is also known as a DNX, a dilation and extraction abortion, where the child is delivered feet first. All that is left inside the mother is the head, a needle is inserted into the base of the child's skull. This child is now seconds away from being an infant in the um, in the uh, the um, you know newborn ward. The kid is the whole body is delivered. Just the head is in the mother. They insert a needle into the base of the skull and they literally suck the brains out of the child. That is perfectly legal under Roe v. Wade. The grounds for that being legal is what is called right to privacy, which is that the decision to do that is something that the mother, according to the Supreme Court, has a right to make in private advised by her medical professionals. So that it is a decision that the mother has a right to make all by herself without reference to the husband, without reference to anybody else, uh, advised if she wishes to be by her uh, medical doctor. So the Roe v. Wade decision is based on this right to privacy idea that was discovered. Um, there, Not all of the justices on the current Supreme Court agree with this idea of right to privacy, by the way. Antonin Scalia uh, who is a strict constructionist, textualist, he would call himself, says that there is no right to privacy as such in the Constitution. Um, and then, of course, you have the other problem of if you hold, if you believe that the child is also a person, who's advocating for the child's right in that circumstance? Anyway, 
uh, Roe v. Wade was followed then by a series of other decisions, um, a, a whole bunch of them, but the most important being Webster versus Reproductive Health Services. Uh, some states are politically conservative and have attempted to deal with Roe v. Wade. They can't stop abortions from being performed. The Supreme Court found that that is a constitutional right for a woman to have an abortion. So certain states, in this case Missouri, in the Webster case, decided that uh, no government funds can be spent, no state government funds can be spent on abortion clinics, and that no state employees can perform abortions. In other words, that if you have a health clinic in Missouri, if you perform abortions, you don't get state subsidy, and if it is a Missouri state-owned hospital or state-owned clinic, it will not perform abortions argument was made to the Supreme Court that Missouri was therefore um, interfering with a woman's right to have an abortion. Supreme Court found that you can have a right to an abortion, but that doesn't entitle you to have taxpayer money pay for it. And so in Webster v. Reproductive Health Services, the court found that this, a state has the right to not spend money on abortion. They can't prevent abortions, but they don't have to spend money on it. Planned Parenthood versus Casey, 1992 case, um, was a, a, a case. Casey was the governor of Pennsylvania. Planned Parenthood is the major national provider of abortions. The state of Pennsylvania, under Governor Casey, had put in a series of restrictions um, so Pennsylvania had required uh, that uh, women, uh, that before an abortion take place, Pennsylvania was saying there had to be a 24-hour waiting period to give women time to think about it, that they had to obtain informed consent, that is, the doctor had to explain what was going on, and there were even attempts to, to have women see the ultrasound of their child that they were about to you know, take the life of, um, that if they were minors, they had to have the consent of their parents because it's a medical procedure, and that if they were married, they had to have, they had to inform the husband before the abortion took place. Presumably, uh, Casey was a very pro-life guy, uh, presumably so that the husband could talk them out of it or something. In the case, the Supreme Court decided, um, first of all, that they let stand Roe v. Wade. They maintained the idea that you have a right to, a woman has a right to an abortion. However, they said that states could put limitations on that abortion as long as it did not pose an, quote, undue burden on women. Therefore, said the state, uh, said the, the Supreme Court, if Pennsylvania wants to, they can put in the 24-hour waiting period, they can put in the informed consent provisions, uh, they can make minors, they can make doctors obtain permission from parents for minors. Um, the only thing they knocked out was that uh, the you couldn't force the women to inform the husbands. That was deemed an undue burden. Since then, there have been a series of attempts by states to limit, in various ways, um, abortion, uh, requiring that they be performed only by licensed surgeons as opposed to nurse practitioners or something, um, that, the, that the, the clinics be uh, insured in certain ways, all really as ways for some of the more conservative states to limit the access the accessibility of abortions and those cases have worked their way through the courts but the the principle of roe has not been touched uh finally i'll point out um uh the uh, lawrence v texas case which is a uh 2003 case um 
which is not about abortion. It's about um, uh, gay sex. Um, Texas had a law against um, gay sex. I mean, you know, in so many words. And uh, this guy, Lawrence, challenged it, again, on the grounds of privacy, that the, um, uh, the state of Texas, the government in general, has no, quote, compelling interest to involve itself in the activities of two consenting adults, what they do in their, in their bedroom. And the Supreme Court um, uh, found that Lawrence had a case, and therefore um, laws against various sexual practices. I mean, you know, basically, if it's not sort of traditional man, woman, let's have a child sex, there were all sorts of laws on the books of various states, some of them leftovers from the 1800s against certain practices. The Lawrence v. Texas decision found that um, the people have a right to privacy when it comes to that, and therefore the government can't interfere in it. And it's not to get all hung up on sex, but that that establishes then a precedent for what the government can get involved in and what it can't. Okay, two last things I just want to mention to you that um, you can read about uh, is national security. Um, one thing that I didn't mention before when we talked about prior restraint, but I mention it now in the context of national security. The government cannot exercise prior restraint, thanks to the First Amendment, against speech or press, even if it is a national security issue. Times v. U.S. Now, be careful. This is not Times v. Sullivan. This is a different case. Times v. United States, 1971, is the so-called Pentagon Papers case. The Pentagon Papers were a uh, secret study that was done within the Department of Defense of the Vietnam War and basically told the secret history of the war, how long it had really been going on for, what the United States' real aims were, and the likelihood of us not winning. They were top secret, and they had been smuggled out of the Pentagon and given to the New York Times. The Nixon administration tried desperately to get a court to block the Times from printing them. And the courts found that they could not engage in prior restraint, even though these were top secret documents that the Times was printing. Um, the printing of the Pentagon Papers uh, was a big part of telling people what was really going on with Vietnam and turning uh, people against that war. So a thing to know about prior restraint and an important case. Also, the USA Patriot Act. After September 11th, 2001, the country was freaked out, panicked. And so the Bush administration went to Congress, requested and got um, the um, the USA uh, um, Patriot Act, which author, which was a huge bill. It did a, a whole bunch of things, but among other things, it allowed the government to um, engage in in what amounted to warrantless surveillance and warrantless searches so-called sneak and peek searches where they could slip it normally when a search warrant is executed they go into the place they serve you with a search warrant and they make their search sneak and peek was they they slip in or is they slip into a place without telling anybody they're there basically break into it peek around see if there's anything interesting there and then leave without having told anybody that they had been there so they're spying uh, essentially, um, they uh, it authorized the government to gather every single electronic communication in the country, every cell phone conversation, every voicemail message, every text message, every email, and sift through them to see if there's anything interesting there. 
It even gave them the right to do things like show up at, at the public library and get a record of every book that somebody had taken out of the library. Um, and they didn't need a warrant for that. The FBI simply showed up and asked for it, and the library not only had to turn it over, but if the library ever told the person that the FBI had been there asking questions, the librarians would all go to jail. So the USA Patriot Act is, even now, highly controversial. Uh, you can look up the details of it if you want. Um, the, there is a uh, the Wikipedia article actually on it I looked at a couple of days ago is not terrible, but there's better things out there. Um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the EFF, if you know what they are, uh, and the American Civil Liberties Union have been fighting pieces of the Patriot Act um, based on uh, Fourth Amendment. So um, uh, it's still highly controversial, but it shows you the problem. In, our, in, in the day of James Madison, uh, surveillance of a person's person and papers meant, you know, walking into their home and opening a box and reading through their mail. Now, in a world of text messages, what, what counts as a search? What kind of warrant do you need for that? Uh, how do you, f how can you follow, so can the government follow somebody around and spy on them in a way that Madison wouldn't have thought, um, you know, in a world of terrorism, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it becomes a very controversial matter. Okay, this was a very long lecture, I know, guys. I hope to make the next uh, couple of lectures to get you through the next chapter much shorter and more reasonable. But as I said, I hope these are helpful. If they are, let me know. If they are absolutely useless to you, then um, let me know that too.